Welcome to the Sheridan Report, brought to you by MyBookie.ag. You can go to MyBookie.ag and put in the promo code TGT100 for up to 100% cash back on up to your first $300 deposit. Also, you can go to TheGrillingTruth.com and find the MyBookie.ag banner at the top of the page. I am your host for the Sheridan Report, Mike Goodpasser, right now. I'd like to welcome in from the Sheridan Report, Bobby Sheridan. How you doing, Bobby? Mike, I'm doing great. I'm glad to be back on. You know, and we've had a couple of days we've been off the air, and I'm glad to be back on. So let's get into it. All right, let's get into it. So hit us off with baseball, Bobby. All right, baseball today, Mike. We've got, uh, you know, Wednesdays and Thursdays have some morning stuff. There. So there's a couple of things that the, you know, the fans have missed already. But we do have. Two top plays still going. One of them is, is in baseball, and we have two-thirds of our mix and match. It's kind of a short schedule today. So the mix and match, the three-team part of it, we've got the Reds at 340 and the Braves at 420. So that's the Reds and the Braves. Um, Reds throwing their ace today, Luis Castillo. It's kind of a battle of aces, Quintana against Castillo. But, but the Cubs have had a tough time winning in Cincinnati. I believe they lost four straight there and a tough one yesterday, and it's no fun, you know, trying to win a game in a ballpark. You're struggling when you got to face Luis Castillo. This guy's been very, very solid, and and I think he's going to outpitch Quintana. And then we got the Braves. You know, Julio Tejeron is going against Wainwright, and this is for the series. These are one-one going into this game, and I like Tejeron here in this matchup. The movement on his fastball, I think, will give the Cardinals some trouble. So. He's a very small favorite. You could actually straight bet him if you'd like. He's minus 107. Uh, so the Reds and the Braves. And maybe you can mix and match them with something you like or the top play, Mike. And the top play, you know, some of these games, you dive into them and things pop out once you dive in. And then there's some things because you do this every day and you have so much in the memory bank that you look at it and you go, okay, boom, I, that that's a play. And then you confirm it and there it is. Well, this is a play tonight, Mike, at Pittsburgh Pirates. This is a top play for me. They're playing the Padres, and and uh, Trevor Williams is sending out their, their ace, Trevor Williams, and he's plus 110 on the road at San Diego. He's from San Diego, Mike. His dad's going to be there in attendance today and his family, and and uh, Trevor Williams has developed himself. You know, We were talking about him. I was really on him a year, year and a half ago winning some nice prices and now he's kind of hit the the forefront people know about him but this is a guy that's got great movement on his fastball keeps the ball down uh does a great job uh keeping the pirates in games and you know we've talked about the pirates when they're starting center fielder starting Marte is in the lineup they are 20 and 10 you know they 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 that you know, 67 percent ball with their starting center fielder and he kind of ignites them they have a, a deep uh, lineup they have a lot of depth and the Padres hit a snag you know they went to the Dodgers and I really expected them to play very competitively and you know they competed in two games but they lost all three and um, Eric Lauer is coming off a horrible start I, I believe Pittsburgh is an easy winner in this game here at San Diego so we like Pittsburgh tonight as a top play in the MLB. All right, Bobby. Where do we want to go now? So let's go and get your hockey game. Do you have anything you like on that matchup tonight, Mike? I think the Bruins will win it. I mean, if you're going to combine it with something, I would say yeah, but it's a minus 120. I don't know how much value there is there. Maybe Carolina will make one final stand, but I think the Bruins are playing so well now. They've won five or six games in a row, and they've been dominant while doing that. So, I would say I would take the Bruins tonight. Just for the sweep. You know, I, I, that, in all sports, it seems like when it goes 3-0 and it's been dominant fashion that those teams, they want to get it over in four. They don't want to screw around. And they, they tend to go four, you know. So, I, not knowing anything about it or the, the, the game, I just know that's how series t- typically go. And Otherwise, what could happen is you could have the – Remember when Dave Roberts stole second base and they wound up getting that game four win? Well, what'd that lead to? A championship. You don't see that happening? 
Dave Roberts isn't going to steal second in that game tonight? I don't think Dave Roberts is going to steal second. I don't think Dave Roberts can skate, probably, <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> Anyhow. All right, Mike. So uh, what we could do, you know, if Boston minus 120, um, we, could, we could put them in our mix and match with the other two that are left in the baseball, and that could be a decent three-team parlay. All right, Bobby. What you know, about – what about the NBA? Because I want to talk about the Blazers and uh, what are they called? The Warriors. I think that's the the feature game tonight for most of the fans and why most of the fans would probably want to listen today. So I wanted to hold that to, for last. And here's another no brainer, Mike. Uh, Portland's gonna gonna cover that game tonight at the very least. It's gonna be about the four minute mark, and they're gonna have about a three point lead or a six point lead. And can they close it out? Uh, how are they going to get there, Mike? They're going to get there making the adjustments that they have to make that they really were poor in in game one. But game one was the game that we, we said going in. I don't know if this was on air because I don't know if we had a show. All these series changed. But I knew we talked about it. This was the game that Portland was going to have the least likelihood of winning, competing at their best level obviously coming off the other series and having only one day in between. It was a big disadvantage. And you saw last night what that second day does in preparation and in mental preparedness with Toronto, how they really played a winning game last night. Milwaukee just blew the last four or five minutes, you know. Um, So tonight with Portland, uh, they get an opportunity now to bounce back from a really poor effort where they turned the ball over 21 times. Lillard himself was seven or eight. And as much as he has the ball, you know, uh, they, those two did not out, outplay the, the two guards for Golden State, and that's what we thought would be a big key and they could match them and then let the rest of the players beat the rest of the players. That would be a series win for Portland, assuming no Durant. So those things didn't happen. They turned the ball over, and then, then we got the – the triple whammy when the Golden State bench outplayed the Portland bench. So there was really no chance to win that game. But with all that said, it was 79-73 going into the fourth, Mike. And this was with all those disadvantages going into the to game one. And so they got, they got blown out in the fourth. They're not going to get blown out in the fourth tonight. They're going to be in the same position except probably reverse. I expect them to have the lead going into the fourth tonight. And then can they hold on? And that's the way I see this game. I think the seven points, seven and a half, is is very good. And I think the straight-up win is, is very possible tonight. So I really like the, the Blazers as a top play tonight, Mike. All right, Bobby. What do we want to do for On This Day? On This Day is a great one. You know, I, I, I love it when – we talk, uh, excuse me, boxing. I love it when we talk boxing. So you don't like it when we talk hockey? <laughs> I, I do too. But for on this day is what I meant. Uh, we never do hockey for on this day. But 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 uh, boxing we tend to do a lot. Rocky Marciano, 1955. We're going all the way back. On this day, he beat TKO Don Cockrell. Cock. Cockell, I'm sorry. Cockell. No R. Yeah, he was English, Cockell, and okay. he got brutalized by Marciano for nine rounds. It was Marciano's last fight. But Marciano's a guy that I really like oh, to talk wow. about. I've read about everything, seen about everything ever shown about him. And the thing about Marciano, he was raised in Brockton, Massachusetts, where, of course, the great marvelous Marvin Hagler would grow up later on. And he was a guy that, in his youth, he worked out on a homemade weight with the equipment, and he used a stuffed mailbag that hung from his tree as a heavy bag. Now, the thing that's interesting about that is I I was a huge boxing fan from basically the time I was born because my dad was. And I always wanted to be a boxer, and I saw the Rocky movie. I started reading all this stuff about Rocky Marciano. So what this turned into, I lived in like Aurora, Indiana, so if I wanted a heavy bag, you had to make your own. I'm pretty sure it was that way for Rocky, too. So we had a neighbor by the name of Charlie Walston who had been in the military. My dad had two, but he didn't save anything. But he had one of these, you know, those old big green duffel bags that the military had in, like, Korea. And we got that. Yeah. And my dad built houses, so he filled it with sawdust. 
So I used to beat the hell out of that bag all the time, and I would think I was Rocky Marciano, or I was Mike Weaver fighting Larry Holmes, but Rocky Marciano had a huge impact on American society, and he still does to this day. Uh, what was the movie with Eddie Murphy? Was it Coming to America, where they're in the barbershop, and they're yeah. talking about boxing, and the white guy that's sitting there brings up, what about Rocky Marciano? And Eddie Murphy's character, oh, white people always bring up Rocky Marciano. And I think the greatness of his story and the greatness of the man gets kind of washed away because of racial issues. I mean, this is a man that retired 49-0, and undefeated, 43 knockouts as the heavyweight champion of the world. He was a high school dropout. He dropped out of school after finishing the 10th grade. He went on to have a amateur career of a total of like 13 fights. He was like nine and four. He won a U.S. Armed, Force, Armed Forces amateur boxing tournament in 1946. He turned pro, not much fanfare. And you'll like this, Bobby. He was actually a catcher and tried out for the Fayetteville Cubs and the Cubs organization. Um, he oh, lasted about wow. three weeks, but he hurt his hand and, you know, had some difficulties there. And from what I read afterwards, he didn't have the greatest arm in the world. But his professional career, he, he started off knocking everybody out. But he's not one of these guys that was coddled, had a bunch of money behind him. And he fought a guy by the name of Carmine Bingo, who was 16-1 and one at the time. And he stopped him in the sixth round and almost killed him. And he said, even up to the day that he died in, I think, 1969, that if Vingo would have died, he would have retired right then. I mean, he stayed with Vingo by Vingo's bedside until Vingo got better. Uh, his next Jeez. fight is probably the closest he ever came to losing. He fought a guy by the name of Roland Lestarza. Lestarza was actually a decent-sized favorite coming into this, and Marciano beat him by a split decision. Um, it, it was a really close fight. And it's by far the closest he ever came to losing. He would go on after he won the title to fight Lestarza again and beat Lestarza rather easily. I think he stopped him in the 10th or 11th round. That was actually the first fight film I ever saw of him. He took on 37-year-old Joe Lewis. And the thing about that is nobody ever gives him credit for this, but Lewis had won like five or six fights, three of them against top 10 contenders. It was actually ranked in the top 10. It was actually favored against Marciano. And Marciano upsets Lewis. Of course, today, it's, you know, he just beat up a really old Joe Lewis. But in actuality, Lewis was still a pretty good heavyweight. Lewis probably controlled the first half of that fight before Lewis or Marciano kind of knocked him out. And the great thing about Marciano is most of the damage Marciano ever did was just hitting guys on the arms because he's hit so hard that he would basically, that's why they dropped their arms, he'd knock them out. Uh, he had a big hook with a big right hand that was called the Suzy Q. And he gets a heavyweight championship fight against Jersey Joe Walcott in Philadelphia. Mar I think it was in September of 52. And Walcott drops Marciano in the first round, steadily built a huge points lead. They go to the 13th round. This is when fights were 15 rounds. And Walmart, or Walcott used basically his trademark. He had this feint that would set up his right hand. And he just beat the hell out of Marciano with it until the 13th round when Marciano didn't fall for the fake faint. He hits Walcott, and this is a picture, if you Google it, I mean, it looks like his hand is going through Walcott's jaw, and he ends up knocking him out. And his first defense came a year later against Joe Walcott, and it was a first-round knockout. And what happened was Walcott just laid down so he didn't have to get hit again. But, and Walcott wow. even kind of admitted that later on. Then he beats Lestarza. He goes on to be legendary light heavyweight champion Ezra Charles, who was also a former heavyweight champion. He beats Cockle. Um, almost came back in 1959. And after his retirement, he was actually, you remember the show Combat when we were growing up? I remember hearing about it. I didn't watch it. Okay, it was a war show, but he was on that. And the thing I really want to get to here, because I think this is the most, this is the most interesting thing. And in 1967, there was a pudgy disc jockey promoter named Maury Warner or Murray Warner. He got like 250 boxing writers and gave them a questionnaire and had them answer all these characteristics 
to rank the 16 greatest heavyweights of all time. He then wrote a radio script of simulated fights, including sound effects that had the fighters battling through an elimination tournament to demonstrate who the greatest heavyweight champion of all time was. Warner used a huge computer. It was called like an NCR 315. If you look this up, it's like six feet by six feet. The public loved it. They ate it up. The radio show had huge success. Now, the winner of this radio show was Rocky Marciano. Muhammad Ali actually was knocked out in the second round of the tournament by James J. Jeffries. Jeffries is a guy that gets underrated. He was an undefeated heavyweight champion when he retired, but five years after he retired, that's where the term Great White Hope came. They bring him back to fight Jack Johnson, but he doesn't really have anything left. He gets the hell beat out of him. Now, you got to remember, this is a rough time for Ali. He was suspended from boxing after refusing to draft to fight in Vietnam. He couldn't fight. He needed money, and he sued Murray Warner for a million dollars, saying that his character and reputation had been impugned by saying, I would lose to Jim Jeffries when I am the greatest of all time. So Warner very shrewdly settled this suit for like a dollar. And the reason Ali settled was there was an agreement to do a filmed computer fight against Rocky Marciano. Have you ever seen the filmed computer fight between Marciano and Ali? That's another one that I've, just, I've seen a couple of clips of it, but I've never watched the whole the whole entire thing. All right, so the public was gullible and ate this up, but on the set, the thing, the stories I've heard because I've actually been able to talk to a few older boxing guys, Kepler deceased now, that were actually on this set, and they said when they got into the studio, they filmed like seventy one minute rounds with a variety of scenarios, as sometimes the two guys would kind of get carried away and actually hit each other, but they filmed for three days in a Miami studio with blacked out windows, tight security, and in fact, they filmed the final scenes just after a federal judge had ordered Ali to go to prison for dodging the draft before the Supreme Court let him go, which we talked about last week, and they were really kind of polar opposites. I mean, you had basically the white play by the rules guy from the 50s in Marciano. You had the black rebel from the 60s who was a Muslim who didn't want to go fight in the war. But from everything I've read about this and the people I've talked to that actually saw this, that there was a huge mutual respect between the two. And you know, Clay, Ali, whatever you want to call him, would actually tell Rocky Marciano how when he was growing up, he would listen on his transistor radio to, you know, fights from Madison Square Garden where Rocky Marciano was the heavyweight champion of the world and he was fighting on that radio and Ali looked up to him his entire time growing up. And yeah, that's me. It's easy to understand why the deal for this fight for Ali because he needed the money. The thing about Marciano was he didn't need the money. He hoarded cash. Um, he would not accept a check from anybody. You had to pay him in cash. And he would ca he would hide the money in his mattress. He would hide it in toilet bowls, in curtain rods. And he was also, I don't know if this is true or not, but I, re I remember reading this in Ring Magazine in like the late 70s. But he was also, they said that he stashed suitcases full of cash at a friend's bomb shelter. And he also, he relished the big stage, though. That's why he flirted with a comeback about eight years before that. And the thing that's funny about this, if you watch this, Ali had a ridiculous advantage in height, weight, reach. Marciano was like 5'9". Ali was 6'3". There was probably 40 pounds in between them. And Murray Warner wanted the fighters to stage knockdowns during the fight. And Rocky had only been knocked down twice in his entire career. He was extremely embarrassed by both times. Ali, I don't think he'd ever been knocked. Well, he'd been knocked down by Henry Cooper in 1963, I think. And neither one of them would agree to go down. And then Rocky finally <laughs> agreed that he would get knocked down. Ali threw a punch and hit him. Rocky went down. And Ali yelled, drop the wop. And Rocky rolled over, took his mouthpiece out, and started laughing hysterically, so they had to shoot it again. And although it, it might have been fun, both guys could still I mean, Rocky was 46 years old, but he could still hit. And the funniest story I've heard was told to me 
a long time ago by a fairly famous person that was in Ali's corner. I'll just go with that. And he said that Ali got hit by Marciano, and Marciano cracked him right in the stomach. And Ali kind of lets out a oof, and he sat down on his stool, and he refused to get up and resume filming until Murray Warner sent one of his aides to the bank to get him an extra $2,000 in cash to get Ollie to continue. <laughs> so, and, and the funny thing is you can find all kinds of pictures if you look hard enough or you look at old boxing magazines where these guys really became good friends. Now, the fight ended with Ali stopping Marciano on cuts in the 13th round. Um, I, I don't know who wins this fight because when I was growing up, I always assumed it was Ali because Ali was bigger to life to me. So was Marciano, but I saw Ali. But what do you think about this? Just like the 72 Dolphins where everybody could say, well, the 78 Steelers were better, the 89 49ers. Rocky Marciano still got one thing that Ali and no other heavyweights ever had, and that is he never got beat. And if you ever get a chance to check this out, I don't know if it's on YouTube or not. I actually bought a DVD of this like 10 years ago, and it does not look authentic. It doesn't feel authentic. And the thing that was interesting to me is the first time I ever saw this, I actually remember exactly when it was and where I was because I'd always read about this and wanted to see it. And it would have been... The night of the 1978 NFC Championship game, the Dallas Cowboys were playing the L.A. Rams, and I knew that this was supposed to be shown at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And I have school the next day. So I'm begging all day for my parents to let me have all school and everything. And then all of a sudden, the weather report comes out that we got a weather storm coming, and we're supposed to get like 6 to 12 inches of snow. So No school. Well, and it just started snowing as my parents went to bed, and this was like 11 o'clock at night. And I asked my dad, I said, go stay there. He said, ah, yeah, yeah. He said, you ain't going to have school tomorrow. So I watched this from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the morning. I go to bed. My mom didn't know my dad let me stay up and stuff. And my mom comes in and wakes me up at like 7 o'clock. You got to get ready for school. I look outside. There's like maybe a half an inch of snow at most on the road. So I had to get up and take my happy ass to school. That wasn't very fun. No, <laughs> and, learned a lesson there. And, and the thing it was, was this, when they released this movie in January of 1970, they released it in like 600 plus theaters around the world. People bought tickets, went in, and the thing was, you know, Rocky knocked him out in the 13th round. I don't think too many people believe that. But there, at the Boston Garden, they showed this, and actually 7,000 people showed up to see it. So, in the end, they made a lot of money. More interestingly, in this country, Marciano won. They filmed two endings. In the European release, Muhammad Ali won. Rocky Marciano won in the United States. Ali won in Europe. So, Ali stopped him on cuts in Europe. I, I don't know. I've, never, I've got the alternate ending on there. I've never watched it, so I don't know. I think that Marciano may have knocked him out in theirs. But I, I would say from those two guys, I would lean towards Ali to probably stop him on cuts because Marciano did have a tendency to bleed a little bit. So, but that's my Rocky Marciano stuff for today. Oh my geez! I mean, it's obvious that you've spent a lot of time over the years, you know, reading and and, and I used to. Now I don't much. because I got these reading glasses and every time I put them on if my wife or kids are around, I get mocked and ridiculed and I basically Bobby, I get bullied. <laughs> well, that's no good. I mean, you know, that's what what happens when you get older and you need reading glasses whether your eyes are good or not. I mean, you just don't see, you know, that's Yeah, when little kids get is. bullied, people get offended, but when it's old kids, nobody cares. <laughs> people laugh. I know, people yeah. laugh. Look, Dad looks like he's 75 years old. He's got reading glasses on. They all love him. <laughs> so, what are you going to Oh, do? man. Well, you know, hey, Mike, I, I appreciate that. That's great. And I didn't know too much about Marciano at all, you know. And so that's, I know a whole, heck of a lot more now than I did. And, um, you know, I hope the the listeners enjoyed that. All right, Bobby. We will be back tomorrow, listeners, at 2 o'clock. we got a Preakness show tomorrow night at 8 Eastern, right? 
Yeah, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. We've got Phil and Vince, part two for the Preakness. It's going to be something else. Phil and Vince will tell us who to bet on. And Vince nailed it last time, but then he got disqualified. Not Vince, but the horse he picked. Right. He got disqualified, <laughs> so we'll see. And and the horse that ran really well, interesting to see what these guys say tomorrow, because War of Will, Will of War, you know, that horse that That's was the one. Horse. He's in yeah. the he, yeah, he's in the one again. He's in the one spot again. And uh, he's one of the favorites. So I'm going to see what they say about him. Phil will have the numbers from his handicapping and, and um, his from his system, you know, his system that he uses. And and um, Vince will have his handicapping, and he'll have a ton of stories, I'm sure. So Hey, and if you want to find great. out about Phil Rankin and the horse betting, if you go look at it now, Bobby, halfway down on the right side of the page, Jeremiah spruced it up a little bit, too. It looks better. You'll have to check that out. Oh, cool. I will. Um, yeah, THG is, is, the, is the website. That stands for the Handicapping Guide. So the handicappingguide.com to get Phil's numbers every day at, at four of the tracks around the country. And, and we've got, uh, you know, Vince, one of the most famous jockey, probably is the most famous jockey agent of all time, as we learned eight Hall of Fame riders he had in his career and just a guy that spent his whole life in horse racing. So he's just story after story after story. He's been there and done it and still alive and kicking. And if you guys heard the Kentucky Derby preview, he is uh, well-spoken still. So it's going to be a great Preakness preview. That'll be fun. All right. And also, to find out, the Sheridan Report followed Bobby on Twitter at Sheridan Report or go to the SheridanReport.com, $10 a day, $50 a month, or you can get the top play of the day for $5 now, Bobby, correct? Or That's right. Bet. You know, we have two yeah. top plays. Yeah, we have two top plays tonight, but for, for what, what I do is some people just like one play. Yeah, like, what's your best bet? They just like to focus on one game, and so if you were to click that button tonight, it would have the Blazers plus the points. So that's, you know, that would be the best bet. And so that's the idea. Sometimes you don't hear the show where there is no show. For $5, you can get the best bet of the day. And that's, you know, going to be the best top play. All right, guys. So I like that two-team or parlay, Mike. Just real quick, that two-team parlay is a big one tonight. The Pirates and the the Blazers, that'd be a nice one. And then we can can use another one where we can go with your hockey, the sweep. That would be the Bruins for the sweep. And then we can connect that with uh, the other two. Before we connect, it, we can connect it with the top plays. That's always a good. That, that's probably what we'll do, Mike. But uh, you could also, uh, listeners, if you'd like to uh, connect it with the other two from the mix and match, that would be the Reds and the Braves. So there's there's the options out there tonight to make some money. And then uh, tomorrow our card will be a little deeper. And and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention we've got. Uh, a lot of early rides are still going on this week. You know, we started the PGA uh, championships this morning uh, from the Beth Page, and uh, we had a couple of matchups. Looks like we're going to split those and be two and two. And um, the ATP tournament is almost, we're almost to the French Open. So they're finishing up the, I believe the last um, kind of of the clay court season, you know, before we get to the major. And that's the Italian Open right now going on. We had um, a lot of success in that tournament this week, and today looks like we're going to split. Well, we did. We split our two matches, this matchups this morning. So that's all done, but that's still going on tomorrow and through the weekend. So still a lot of opportunities the rest of this week. All right, Bobby. Money. So we have a big weekend in store at the Grueling Truth, where tonight at 9 o'clock, we will have Inside Boxing Weekly with myself, Jeremiah, and John Einreinhofer. And we will be previewing the heavyweight title fight between Dominic Brazil and Deontay Wilder, or as I like to call him, Beyonce. Or, you know, he's just a bitch. You know, Deontay Wilder <laughs> reminds me of Fat Joe from Canada because they all serve no purpose and they're both just bitches. All right, guys, we're going to wrap this show up for today. I want to remind you, you can hear all of our shows on thegrudlingtruth.com. You can also hear us almost anywhere. Well, anywhere. You have podcasts, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, Live Radio. You can download our iTunes app. But for now, 
We will see you tonight at 9, tomorrow at noon with me and Steve, tomorrow at 2 with me and Bobby, and in the Preakness show tomorrow night live at 8 o'clock Eastern. Is this Wednesday or Thursday, Bobby? This is Thursday, Mike. This is Thursday, isn't it? All right, I thought it might be Wednesday for a while. But all right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. I do that So <laughs> for Bobby Sheridan, you know, I got reading glasses too. I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. Speak.